Yeah, I think. So yeah, I think we can get started now. Um, okay, so I think we are live also on YouTube now. So everything's everything's okay. So yeah, let's start. So good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, everywhere, and welcome. Uh, we are excited to have you join us for another webinar on this new series from the Brazilian Participation Group on the Rubin Observatory's Legacy Survey of Space and Time. So this webinar is streamed live on YouTube, and you can find the link on our website, linea.org.br, or on YouTube channel, uh, at Linea MCTI, on both Linea is the name of our lab, spelled like L-I-N-E-A, which stands in Portuguese for Interinstitutional E-Astronomy Laboratory. And so, yeah, so it is really an honor and a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Or Grauer. Dr. Grauer is an associate professor in astrophysics at the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation at the, at the University of Portsmouth and the research associate at the American Museum of Natural History, so, which is quite awesome. <laughs> he received his PhD in physics and astronomy from the Tel Aviv University and has held postdoctoral research positions at different top institutions like Johns Hopkins, New York University, and the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard and the Smithsonian Institute. So Dr. Carl Grauer is a leading expert in his field and has a broad range of research interests, but in particular for today, I think it's important to mention that he has made significant contributions to our understanding of the so-called transient astrophysical phenomena, of which I'm confident we'll have a nice opportunity today of learning on this webinar, which is entitled Searching for Transient Treasures in Galaxy Spectra. And so one interesting thing that I learned today is that between those phenomena, well, we all know that we have supernovae, you know, uh, which is in, uh, what I learned today is that, which is uh, ac actually also the name of one book from, from Dr. Earl Brown. So uh, I can also say with confidence that he's also a writer. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, uh, with no further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Earl uh, uh, Thank you very much uh, for accepting our, our invitation again. And please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Hugo, for that introduction, and thank you, Louise, for inviting me. Um, I recall that when we met back at UCL, we were talking about data mining and all the fun things we can do with that. And so um, today I decided that I would talk to you about two projects of mine where we used Galaxy Spectra, um, collected by large spectroscopic surveys to do something completely different. Um, so I won't be talking about LFT, I'm sure, but I hope um, what I will discuss will still be interesting. So before that, I did want to say a few words about my institute and university. So as Hugo said, I'm an associate professor at the University of Portsmouth. Portsmouth is located in the south of Britain. Um, it was founded by the Romans um, and was one of the uh, major ports from which the D-Day invasion of Europe um, took place in World War II. And today it's a very nice little city, uh, which has a very nice young university. Uh, we are uh, an institute in the university, uh, which means we're, we're very similar to other large departments of astrophysics uh, around the world. We have four areas uh, that we specialize in. Um, as the name implies, the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation, uh, we do a lot of theoretical and observational cosmology, including work on um, different types of modified and exotic gravity. We also have a new group of three professors who specialize in gravitational waves and who are part of the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. And then there's astrophysics, which includes anyone who doesn't do 
all the other stuff. So um, we have Claudia Marston and Daniel Thomas who work on galaxy evolution. Uh, Be Becky Canning who works on the evolution of active galactic nuclei. Uh, Dan Whalen who works on um, the theory of primordial stars. And myself who works on different types of transient phenomena. We're members of quite a few major surveys, including LSST, um, and also including uh, the SDSS and DESI, which I'll mention today, uh, as well as Foremost, um, Lisa, Castor, and so on. And we have plenty of postdoctoral fellowship opportunities. Some of them are British national fellowships, uh, we're also open now, again, we're open to European fellowships such as the Marie Curie. And we have our own prize postdoctoral fellowship named after the cosmologist, Dennis Shama. So if you're interested in postdocs in any of these areas, please um, look out for these different fellowships or get in touch with me for more information. So, I'm going to tell you three things today, okay? I'm going to show you that any large scale spectroscopic galaxy survey can be turned into a transient survey. And I'm going to show this with two specific examples where I'll talk about supernovae and how we can learn about their progenitors and then how we can learn, uh, how we can connect between a very rare type of galaxy with strong iron corona lines and tidal disruption events. And finally, I'll just mention it without showing anything today, um, that really the biggest promise of this technique is discovering brand new types of transients that are hiding out in the galaxy spectrum. Um, the stamp, uh, well, I usually, in, in, in these talks, I usually have stamps uh, on the slides where something's important. Not this time, but I still kept the slide. Um, it shows uh, a common European starling, which in Romanian is called Grau. So now you know where my name comes from. Unfortunately, there are no starlings in South America as far as I know, though they were introduced into North America at the end of the 19th century and they exploded across North America. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, given a few decades or centuries, they'll make their way down into South America as well. Okay, so most transients, right? A transient is anything that wasn't there before, suddenly appeared in the night sky, sticks around for a while, and then disappears again. Um, so among these the very, the, there are lots of different types of transients. I study supernovae and tidal disruption events. And I recently published a book about supernovae as Hugo mentioned. And coming out next August will also be a book about galaxies. Now, almost all of these transients are discovered in wide field optical surveys. Well, uh, ever since Fritz Zwicky started doing this in um, the 1930s, the idea was that you take multiple images of the same patch of sky day after day, week after week, month after month, and you look for anything that has changed. And, and then you follow up and you study those things. So that's how supernova, study, supernova studies began, and it's still the way we do um, supernova surveys today. Now, this has allowed us to discover thousands of transients every year, but you lose some information when you do this, right? Um, when you take images that include hundreds of thousands of galaxies, you only get the photometry and usually only in the optical and usually, usually only in two or three filters, which means that you lose any information, most information about the galaxies themselves their masses, their star formation rates, specific star formation rates, metallicities. If you want to get those correctly, you really need spectra. 
And that's why we have large-scale spectroscopic galaxy surveys. Many of these surveys, such as SDSS, DESI, FOMOS, these are, cos these are cosmology surveys designed to measure emission lines from which we get redshifts. And that allows us to map the distribution of galaxies throughout distance and time, which is then used to derive variant acoustic oscillations and other uh, probes of cosmology. It also allows us to study the galaxies themselves, because from the spectra you can get detailed information about the galaxies, and that way learn how they evolved, not just morphologically, but also astrophysically. So in this talk today, I'm going to um, focus on two of these surveys. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS, is probably the most famous survey um, in modern astronomy. It's been around for two decades now. Uh, and has collected hundreds of thousands of spectra of galaxies and stars. Uh, it also has um, several dedicated pipelines that produce uh, not just photometry and the spectra themselves, but also stellar masses, star formation rates, uh, star formation histories, metallicities, and so on. The dark energy spectroscopic instrument is new. This is a new 5,000 fiber-fed robotic spectrograph that was mounted on the 4-meter male telescope in Kitt Peak just uh, two years ago and has been in operations for about a year and a half. We actually started operations just before COVID and then, of course, had to lock down. Um, but we recently uh, released the first uh, data release from the survey. Um, and we, I think we're now a year and a half into our five-year survey. And in this survey, we are collecting spectra of millions of galaxies. The most important survey for me is the one called the Bright Galaxy Survey, or BGS, which is surveying 10 million galaxies down to an R-band magnitude of 19 and a half, which is deeper than SDSS. But for cosmology, there, uh, there will also be collecting spectra of luminous red galaxies and emission line galaxies. So this is going to be a treasure trove for anyone studying galaxies. But now let's see what we can what we can do to use these to study transients. And so I mostly work on type 1a supernovae, which are very famous for being um, standardizable candles used for cosmology. And here the idea is that the way that type 1a supernovae brighten, reach peak, and then decline is um, is is almost uniform among all type 1a supernovae. It's not quite. There is a relation that um, the more luminous type 1a's uh, take longer to reach peak and decline than the dimmer ones, but we can calibrate this and that way we can use these supernovae to measure distances to faraway galaxies. Um, well, the idea is that you get, um, you have two supernovae, one of them is near enough to you that you can, you know the distance from other indicators, such as sapphire stars or tip of the red giant branch or anything, any other way you want to measure distances. Uh, and then you have a distant supernova, which is fainter, uh, but has the same kind of light curve. And because of that, you know what its luminosity should be, right? And then you can compare uh, the difference in magnitudes between the two supernovae. And because you know the intrinsic luminosities, you can derive a distance. And in this way, back uh, at the end of the 1990s, two groups in the US, um, discovered that instead of decelerating, 
the expansion of the universe was actually accelerating. And we now attribute this to something we call dark energy, and we know very little about. Okay, so type 1a supernovae are great, they're amazing, but we still don't know exactly what type of star explodes as a type 1a or how the explosion takes place. There are lots of different ideas, but we're not in consensus. What we do agree on is that what you need is to blow up a carbon oxygen white dwarf. But white dwarfs are inherently stable, right? If you leave them alone, they'll simply cool down for the rest of time. So you need to do something, right? Uh, and most models place the white dwarf in a complicated relationship with a companion star. This companion star can be main sequence or a giant star, in which case the white dwarf will start to steal hydrogen from the star and burn that hydrogen on the surface of the white dwarf. And if you burn it stably, then the white dwarf will accrete the helium ash from the hydrogen burning and slowly grow in size, which means that it will also decrease in, slowly grow in mass so that it will decrease in volume. And as that happens, the temperature and pressure in the core will go up to the point that carbon is ignited and you get a thermonuclear explosion. Alternatively, you can have two white dwarfs. And as they orbit each other, they lose energy and angular momentum to gravitational waves until finally they merge. And when they merge, again, you get a more massive white dwarf and you can explode. So how do you tell these models apart? Well, there are lots of different ways. Uh, what I focused on in my PhD is one marker called the delay time distribution, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in order to get that marker, you first needed to measure supernova rates. And to do that, you needed to find supernovae in a controlled survey. So for one of these surveys, I went to SDSS and I developed a method to locate supernova signals embedded in galaxy spectra. So in the top panel in gray is an SDSS spectrum. In green is a best fitting galaxy model, which you can see doesn't do a very good job. But if you add to that a supernova spectrum, then you get the blue line which is a very good fit. Then at the bottom in gray, we have the residual from removing just the galaxy from the spectrum. And in red, we have the supernova template. Now this is a, this is one of the brightest supernovae in my sample. We have very high contrast relative to the galaxy. So it's easy to see. But uh, with my code, I was able to detect more than 100 type 1a supernovae, including ones that you wouldn't necessarily tell were, were there or were just noise. About 20 core collapse supernovae, so other types of supernovae, and more than 1,000 active galactic nuclei. And so from a data mining perspective, Okay, we have here a sample of about 700 to 800,000 spectra, almost all of which are just clean galaxies. But by chance, a small number of these galaxies will have had a supernova in them when the fiber was put on the galaxy and the spectrum was taken. Okay, now the number is small, it's about one supernova in a hundred thousand spectra. But because SDSS took nearly a million spectra, that was enough to get a sample of a hundred objects, which is a pretty good sample uh, as compared to other surveys of the time. Today we have we have um, large surveys like the dark energy survey that can collect thousands of supernovae. 
So, you know, we're already an order of magnitude beyond this. But as in every experiment, right, you tailor the sample to the experiment. So with 100 type 1a supernovae, I could measure supernova, type 1a supernova rates as a function of galaxy stellar mass, because I have the masses from the spectra. And we see that there's this very clear correlation where uh, more massive galaxies seem to have lower um, mass normalized rates. The question is, why do you get this correlation? I also found that there didn't seem to be any correlation between the rates and star formation rates. But when we looked at specific star formation rates, so the star formation rate divided by the stellar mass, uh, we recovered um, a correlation that was also found by other surveys using imaging. So you see that in quiescent galaxies, the ones here in red, uh, the rate is flat, and then it starts going up in star forming galaxies as you go to higher and higher specific star formation rates. And again, it wasn't clear why we were seeing these correlations. So what we did to, to try and test this was combine the delay time distribution, which I'll show you in a second, with a known correlation between um, the masses and ages of galaxies, where more massive galaxies tend to be older than less massive ones. Um, this is this correlation shown here from a paper by Galazzi et al, where you can see here you have um, the age of the galaxy as a function of stellar mass. And you can see how it rises with stellar mass. Now, the delay time distribution, you can think of this as a transfer function or a Green's function that connects between the star formation history of a specific region and the ensuing supernovae. So the idea here is that you have, you have a burst of star formation, and then you start counting how many supernovae you have after one year, two years, 10 years, 100, 1,000, a million, and so on. And we, we, as in myself, my advisor, Dan Maoz, and others in the community consistently found that the delay time distribution, um, these measurements here, was, is consistent with a t to the minus one-ish power law. And this power law, you can see here, is consistent with what you would expect from, um, from the merger of two white dwarfs. The other model where you accrete mass from a main, main sequence or a giant star doesn't do a very good job um, adhering to the models, to the, to the observations. Okay, so we have our delay time distribution, we have the galaxy mass age correlation. And when we combine them, we get this gray line, which passes through our observations. This is not a fit, okay? The only thing that is fit here is the normalization. Okay, so this gray line can go up and down, but not sideways. And its shape, is, is, is determined only by those correlations I showed you, not by the measurements. Yet it gives you uh, a very consistent fit. Not only that, it also fits the other correlations I showed you. The, the correlation with specific star formation rates seems uh, pretty straightforward, but, the, but when it comes to the star formation rates, we get this roller coaster ride which looks strange, it looks weird. Um, if I had just shown you the observations, like as I did before, I would have said there was no correlation here, that the rates were flat. Yet this is telling me that there's something intrinsically interesting going on here. So to understand this, we go back to why it's so important to look for these transients in 
spectroscopic galaxy surveys. Because now we can compare this directly to the uh, galaxy properties of the galaxies in this specific survey, namely SDSS. And, and so here we're looking, can, you can see my mouse, right? No, you ah, I should be here. Now, can you see my pointer now? Yes. Yes, okay. So you're looking at galaxy stellar mass as a function of star formation rates. And as usual, we have our um, two main areas. In red, we have active galaxies. And in blue, we have star forming galaxies. Um, and now you can and the, notice that the star formation rates are given here um, on the same scale. So you can compare things directly. And what we're seeing here is that we start with passive galaxies uh, with masses around 10 to the 10 solar masses. And then as we go to higher star formation rates, we rise in stellar mass. And when we rise in stellar mass, we're looking at older galaxies. And when we're looking at older galaxies, we're sampling the delay time distribution later on when the number of supernovae produced is smaller. Okay, so what we get out of this is that as we go from low mass passive galaxies to high mass passive galaxies, the mass normalized rate goes down. And then we transition from high mass passive galaxies down here to low mass star forming galaxies. So younger galaxies, which means that we're sampling the delay time distribution earlier. And so this transition gives us this rise in the rates. But once again, as we follow SDSS, we rise in stellar mass, which means that even the star forming galaxies, are, we're looking at older star forming galaxies, we're going down, we're sliding down the delay time distribution and the rate once again goes down. And if that, you know, that if that explanation sounds like witchcraft, we can look at specific star formation rates. And then here we can see, using the same explanation, we can see why the rates start out as flat in passive star, in passive galaxies. Because when we when you look at specific star formation rates, the cloud of passive galaxies is closer to being a pure circle, right? There isn't as much variation, which is why you stay flat. And then when you transition to star forming galaxies, you go from high mass to low mass, which means you're going from old galaxies to young galaxies, and you're going up the delay time distribution and producing more type 1a supernovae. Questions about this? Okay, so this is where I'm going to stop when it comes to supernovae. I have other projects that include supernovae, but these are the ones that included galaxy spe uh, spectra. And so I wanted to show you first how we find them. And second, the kind of kinds of things we can do with them, right? Well, the main thing is how do we compare different um, different properties of the supernovae in these case in this case the rates with galaxy properties that we can only properly get from spectroscopy. So if there are no questions about supernovae, yes, maybe maybe one one question. Not sure if can you hear me well? Yeah. yeah. Just want just want to take the opportunity. So, then then you mention about so, so this is everything with SDSS data. I, I yeah. presume with like final SDSS data. So you, you will mention about how 
these things, how we expect these things to change or to improve better with DESI now or in the forthcoming years? So in DESI and in Foremost, uh, which is a European um, spectrograph that will do something very similar, um, the numbers increase. Okay, the numbers increase by an order of uh, an order of magnitude from about one million galaxies to ten million, and so using the same kind of technique, you can you can find more supernovae, right? Um, but just growing the sample isn't interesting enough. So so that's why um, in the next section I'll show you what else we can do. Where, what, what, what we can do now with DESI that um, we, I'll show you something that started off in SDSS and we're now doing in DESI. And, we ex, and, and then we do expect to do better in a, in a significant way. So, so let's continue and talk about time disruption events. So a time disruption event is a bright flow that happens when a star is silly enough to go too close to a supermassive black hole, um, cross its tidal radius, and get disrupted by the black hole's gravity. So when this happens, um, about half of the star's mass is ejected from the system, while the other half is caught by the black hole's gravity and starts falling in. And as usual with most supermassive black holes, when something falls in, it first circularizes and creates an accretion disk. And for some reason during this process, um, for reasons we're still debating, uh, you get this bright flow. Uh, it could be because of, um, because of the accretion disk itself, or it could be because of the infalling streams uh, crossing each other and shocking each other. There are different um, theories out there uh, and they're still in contention. What's important is that we get a flare that should peak in, the, in soft X-rays or hard UV, uh, but should also be seen in the optical uh, radio and other bands. Um, theory predicted that the light curve would decline as a power law with an index of minus five thirds. Um, and this is indeed seen in many uh, TDE candidates. Uh, the light curves are also um, achromatic, meaning that they don't, uh, they don't show any, any interesting color evolution like supernovae. We, we started finding candidates in the 1990s, first in X-ray uh, and UV surveys. And then in the 2000s, we started discovering them in the optical, in the same um, wide field uh, imaging surveys in which we discover supernovae. So we've been at it for about 20, 30 years, and we have about 100 TDE candidates. So you can see we're, we're, these are still very early days. We only discover a handful of these every year. And we're, we're still you know, learning the basics. So we're only now starting to classify them into different spectroscopic types, for example, based on whether they do or do not have uh, helium-2 features or hydrogen features or you know, uh, neon and so on. It's, I'm sorry, nitrogen. Um, these are interesting, first of all, just because they exist and we want to understand the physics, but they're also very interesting because they provide us with a new way to probe the physics and the environments of supermassive black holes. Um, so there are different, different ideas out there, some of them already in practice. For example, we can use the light curves of TDEs to measure 
or at least to estimate the mass of the supermassive black hole. And we can do this not just for supermassive black holes, but also for intermediate mass black holes, uh, which are harder to do with um, things like the M-sigma relation or reverberation mapping. We can also use TDEs to probe the spins of supermassive black holes. I won't show this today, but you can look it up. Uh, and some have suggested that TDEs could have grown the seeds of supermassive black holes in the early universe, at least up to masses of a few hundreds of thousands of solar masses, after which gas accretion would take over. So, so just as su with supernovae, they play lots of, lots of different roles in the universe, and we can use them as tools. But to do that, we, we need to understand them, right? We need to understand the physics. We need to understand how they happen. Now, as with supernovae, most of the TDs are discovered in optical transient surveys. But we might be able to, to discover them in galaxy spectra as well. And this started out in the SDSS when Stephanie Komosa noticed one galaxy with very strong iron coronal lines, these lines here. They're called coronal lines because these high ionization iron lines were first detected in the sun's corona, okay? And the name stuck, just like planetary nebulae. Um, but otherwise, in galaxies, they have nothing to do with coronae. You can think of them as just high ionization iron lines. Okay, you can see here iron 7, iron 10, iron 11, there's also iron 14 over here. Um, and um, Stephanie Komosa suggested that the X rays um, emitted by TDE flares were exactly the type of hard radiation you needed to excite iron to these high ionization states. And she had her arguments for why these weren't active galactic nuclei or supernovae. Because you do see these emission lines in active galactic nuclei as well. Except that in AGNs, these lines are usually much, much weaker. Um, and they often stay relatively stable for years. If this was something caused by a transient, you would expect these lines to change over time and, and at some point fade away. So after this uh, first discovery, Juan et al. Uh, discovered six more objects in SDSS that they said had these similar high ionization iron lines. Uh, and one of these was a bit more interesting than the others. This one over here. This one you can see also has a broad hydrogen feature and a broad feature where helium-2 lives. So this was one of the early signs that perhaps these objects were indeed related to tidal disruption events. Young et al. Uh, this is the same group as Wang et al., uh, then waited a decade and got follow-up spectroscopy of these objects and saw that in, um, in four of the seven cases, the lines indeed decreased or disappeared completely, whereas in three of them, um, they seem to remain stable. We recently... Uh, did the same. We went back and got more follow-up spectroscopy. Now it's 20 years since the original SDSS observations. And we confirmed that in five of the seven, um, this is extreme corona line emitting galaxies, ECLEs, in seven of these galaxies, the lines had disappeared completely. Uh, in some cases, we saw that while the iron lines disappeared, you can see it disappearing here, 
the oxygen three lines uh, grew in strength appreciably. Okay. And in two of the seven cases, nothing changed. Okay. And so, first of all, why would you see the iron lines fade away, but oxygen lines become stronger? So, Young et al. 2013 suggested that what we were doing here was basically um, doing, um, doing an MRI, if you will, of the circumnuclear material around the black hole. Well, when you get, you have your TDE, you get a blast of hard radiation running into the inner edge of the circumstellar material. And that hard radiation ionizes um, the iron lines. Okay. Um, and then over time, as the iron lines recombine, you get softer radiation flowing into the flowing deeper into the circumstellar material and those lower energy uh, photons ionize the oxygen free lines okay so as the ion lines fade you see the oxygen lines go up so this if this is indeed the case then we have a new way of probing the chemical composition of the circumstellar material around black holes and mapping them, mapping it, okay? Because as it fades with time, you can see how this moves into the circumstellar material. However, in two of the seven cases, you know, the lines stayed the same. So we still need to do a better job of telling which of these uh, objects really are transients and which are not. Um, one way to do this is to look at BPT diagrams. This is the diagnostic you usually use to tell galaxies apart from active galactic nuclei. And this is a this is a bit of a confusing plot. We didn't find a way to make it not totally confusing. Um, the different measurements show you the different symbols show you how these observations change with time and the colors are for each of the objects and what we find is that over time so the the these objects start out mostly in the star forming or composite region but then over time as the iron lines fade and oxygen lines go up they seemingly move into AGN territory but you have to be careful here right because we don't think they're AGNs, we just think that the um, strong oxygen lines are mimicking AGNs. And you can see this much better in the mid-infrared. Well, when you look at mid-infrared color evolution, you see here, these are our two, the two objects that did not change over time. And the color evolution did not change either. And they're located where you expect to find active galactic nuclei. Whereas the other five objects, their color evolution declined so that it's now firmly in the non-AGM regime. If you measure this, the, the, these declines, you find that they follow a power law decline whose index, these red dots, these are our measured indexes, these are consistent with indexes of the light curve evolution of optically selected TDs. Okay, so if you notice, I'm building a case uh, rung by rung for why these um, uh, emission line galaxies are the light echoes of time disruption events. Uh, now, for anyone who's interested, we've created a template spectrum of what these variable ECLEs look like. This is still very early days. So, you know, we need more objects in order to really bulk up this template. And as time goes on, uh, we find more and more evidence for the link between these ECLEs and TDEs. So what you're seeing here is a spectroscopic time series 
of one TDE, okay, discovered in the optical. Um, and as you go on, you know, you go into hundreds of days after discovery, at around 300 days, so very hard to see here, but you see these tiny nubs, which develop into these lines here, this is where they start to develop the iron um, corona lines. So we now have two, I think two TDEs where we've seen, we've seen these iron lines develop. Here they developed um, hundreds of days after discovery. In another object, they developed around peak. Why the difference in time scales? Probably because of the distance between the supermassive black hole and the circumstellar material. Okay, so this was all SDSS, still SDSS, but my postdoc, Dr. Peter Clark, has written a code to, this, to detect these lines in DESI galaxies. And he's now looking for these in DESI. This is one, this is our first really strong candidate. We have a few more, but they're not as strong as this one, where you can see the lines clearly here. Um, and we're now following up this object, and Peter is writing up um, a paper about how this code works and about the, um, our first uh, candidate. And because DESI is so much bigger than SDSS, we hope to discover you know, not five objects, but maybe 50 or more. And this is where the size does matter, okay? Going from 100 supernovae to 1,000 isn't a big deal. But going from five TDE, suspected TD light echoes to 50, that is a big deal because then hopefully we'll start seeing differences between them and maybe differences in host galaxy properties and so on. It'll be a much richer sample. At the same time, my PhD student, Joe Callow, has, has gone back to SDSS and used um, Peter's code to look for more uh, co uh, iron corona lines. And indeed, he found eight more objects. But of those eight, only one seems not to be an AGM. And so, you know, maybe we're up from five to six. But with those six objects, Joe has just, just a few weeks ago, measured the rate of these um, extreme corona line emitting galaxies as a function of, um, as a function of, uh, sorry, normalized to galaxies. So here, this is rates per galaxy, if number of these are galaxy, number of ECLEs per galaxy per year. And here on the right, this is per unit volume. And so his, his measurement is shown here in black, it's the black square. And you can compare it to all these other measurements of TDEs discovered either in the optical, those are the circles, or in X-ray surveys, these are the Xs, okay? And the important thing to take out of this is that the rate of these extreme corona line emitting galaxies is consistent with the rate of TDEs. It's about one per 10 to 100,000 galaxies. There was no reason a priori to assume this. And so this is so a piece of evidence for the gap between. Can, can I ask a quick question on this figure? Yes. So is there any reason why on the other measurements that, that you guys are plotted here, there's no error on the redshift? They didn't put an error on the redshift. It is just, it's just, they, they, it's just because they, they couldn't do it or something like that, but there's no... I don't think, no, I don't think they couldn't. I think they just didn't. Just, okay, that's, that's fair enough. <laughs> I like to put error bars on redshift. Ever since I did, ever since I started doing supernova surveys as a PhD student, I liked putting error the horizontal error bars as well. Not everyone does this. It's um, it's uh, it's more about style than than substance. But it's important because Joe Callow's next project 
will be to do this kind of survey in BOSS. So everything I showed you from SDSS was on the legacy surveys, um, SDSS 1 and 2. BOSS, which came in in SDSS 3, is another fear, is another about million um, galaxy spectra, but at a higher median redshift. SDSS has a median redshift of about uh, 0.1, BOSS is, has a median redshift of 0.2. So I hope that Joe will discover new ECLEs in BOSS. No one has uh, looked for them though. And, and then we'll see whether there is any redshift evolution in the rate. Okay, so this is where I'll finish and say that, you know, I hope I've showed you that we can now turn any large scale spectroscopic galaxy survey into a transient survey and use it to look for not just supernovae, but also tidal disruption events. And I've showed you how I've used this to study supernova rates um, and, and show that type 1a supernovae are consistent with orig originating from double white dwarf binaries. And that we're, um, we're building a case for linking a rare type of galaxy with high ionization iron lines to tidal disruption events. Well, those iron lines are, are well, where we can then use these iron and oxygen lines to, to do an MRI of the circumstellar material around the supermassive black hole. And as I said, I only mentioned this, but really the biggest promise of this technique is to discover anomalies, okay? Um, this is what Stephanie Comosa did when she discovered that first ECLE. She said, hey, these iron lines are abnormally strong. Maybe this is something new. Um, you can do this in general. You can say, hey, I have 10 million galaxy spectra. And in them, there are, we know there are supernovae, we know there are tidal disruption events. What if there are other things, things that we have no, we haven't seen before? But that's another type of uh, data mining project. For that, you need to go into not just data mining, but also um, artificial intelligence. So I'll leave that for hopefully for another, le another lecture a few years down the road when we have some more interesting results to show. So with that, I'll finish and I'll take your questions. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to react here, but I cannot get the, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank I didn't, you. I couldn't find it. <laughs> anyway, oh, look, thanks for coming for the excellent and very original talk. Very interesting. And it uh, gives a lot of food for thought. Uh, very interesting. Congratulations. And uh, is, is DASI, I mean, I, I mean, from what I understand, you're already analyzing DASI, right? Yeah, DASI is already coming in. The first day data released um, included survey validation data. Um, but we already, you know, we, we've already started talking about the first year data release. Okay, fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. So, yeah, maybe, yeah, first of all, thanks a lot. Really nice talk. Uh, and let me, let me see if people, people here in Zoom, anyone has a, a question? Just let us know, just chime in if you want. Uh, we were checking also YouTube, and maybe we don't have too much questions from YouTube, or any question from YouTube. Uh, in the meantime, if I may, I, I have a curiosity question, you know. Um, so in terms of these transients, is there any help from simulations? Is there people working on, like, working from simulations? Uh, or thinking about using simulations to try to also help to understand these processes? Oh, de definitely. There are, there, are, there are quite a few theoreticians involved in studying tidal disruption events. So you can see here the, the dashed black line. This is the this is the TDE rate as derived from, from theory um, of 
uh, two body relaxation. Basically, the idea that you know you have stars uh, around the supermassive black hole, and because of um, the dynamics between them, um, the orbits will change and some of them will fall in. Okay, so that gives you a rate of ten to the minus four. Um, but then we have observed rates that are as low as ten to the minus five. So it's a question of who, who's right, right? Theory or observations? Um, again, the, there's a lot of theory going into how exactly you get TDs, right? What is it in the circularization into the accretion disk around the SMBH that gives you the TD? And um, the Wang et al group. Uh, is also doing uh, theoretical analyses of you know the circumstellar material the, around the black hole. If you do assume that these corona lines are caused by the TDE, uh, but the, this is there's still room, right? This is still a very young field, so there's still room for lots of theory, lots of simulations. If this is of interest to you, please you know jump in. I see. No, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, no, I always imagine. You know, thanks a lot for, for 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 this. And and I'm not sure. Is is there anyone that that wants to make another question? Let me check here the chat. Uh, uh, I think if not, we are on the top of the hour. So please join me. Uh, thank you again, or for the nice talk. And, and yeah, with this, I think I think we finish our webinar today. Thank you very much, Ian, for for accepting our invitation and for your nice talk. Hope Thank to see you. you. Yeah. I'm sorry I can't actually be physically in Brazil. Like, yeah, no, well, but but yeah, we, we still have these opportunities, and, and thanks a lot for for accepting it. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and